This is Spotlight, a series inspired by Spin's journey of reimagining mobility in cities. Join us as we host conversations with innovators and influencers who are shaking things up. Hi, I'm Ewan, co-founder and president of Spin, the micromobility company. I'm here in Miami, where、uh, Spin is doing an activation、um, based on the theme of art that moves you. So we're here at the Not Another Art Show, where we've had marquee and local artists custom painting scooters that we'll be releasing on the streets. So I'm sitting here, very excited,、uh, with the two co-founders of Iconic,、um, Mark and Jeff. Nice so, to meet you. Nice、man. to meet you. Nice、What's、to up, meet you.、Man. Thanks for coming in. Early in the morning, we actually live in the same building, and we live in the、How、same crazy building. Is that? Yeah. So iconic. I just heard about it、uh, yesterday, actually, and super interesting story.、Uh, may mind telling our, our listeners like what it is and how you guys come came about. Yeah, so I guess long story short, in、uh, in about 2015, I was touring the U.S. on a tour bus with this hat company called Melon.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in a store called Laced in Boston, and I saw a picture of、uh, of Pusha T on the wall, the rapper. And I asked the owner of the company. I was like, "Oh, who drew this? I really love it." And it turned out that the artist was actually in the store. His name was T.J. Bransfield.、Uh, he had never sold a piece of art before. He was actually a tattoo artist, and he had some art. And、uh, I was friends with Rob Kardashian at the time, so I gifted Rob a piece. Rob posted it on Instagram. T.J. Bransfield got 5,000 followers. Got an email asking, "Can I buy some art?" And in 2015, I became a quote-unquote art dealer. Art dealer. I sold. Have you bought art before? Like, I had I, no idea. I was I, just a hustler and a sales guy, and I sold a piece for a thousand dollars. And you fast forward to now,、uh, his pieces are up to twenty thousand dollars. Megan Trainor, Snoop Dogg, a bunch of NBA guys, Scott Disick, Kevin Hart. And as I started working with him in about 2016, I started realizing that nobody could afford the art. So I was like, wow, there's a huge hole in the affordable art market. So I dropped a limited time print, not limited units. So I kept、uh, my upside limitless and、uh, made twenty thousand dollars in two days. So I was like, okay, there's a huge hole in、yeah. this market. And at that point, I was working with Jeff for about maybe five years, and Jeff was. The hardest working, most talented graphic designer I'd ever worked with, and I saw the hole in the price point art market. And then Jeff saw on Instagram everybody was posting memes, motivational quotes, photography.、Um, and at that point, I owned big accounts on Instagram. So we just kind of merged. Me seeing the hole in the affordable art market. Jeff kind of had the niches and the topics, and I had these big accounts. So I just started bartering on these big pages. If you have a million and I have half a million, you post me once, I post you twice, and I was just bartering, bartering, bartering. I'm、um, making a thousand dollars here and there, and then in 2017, February 27th of 2017, we moved from Squarespace to Shopify. In March, we started doing ads. Month one, six figures, and then 13 months in, really went up in revenue, and the rest is history. That's cool. When you were, were you designing your first piece, did you have sort of concerns that it wouldn't sell? Like, what was the very first thing that you guys、uh, sold? No. So basically, when we started the company in San Diego, we just wanted to. Sell some of my art because、um, okay. at this time, well,、um, to take it back,、yeah. um, I've been in private art classes since I was like six or seven years old. So I've been doing art my whole life. I've always been known as the art kid growing、mm-hmm. up. Literally grew up doing every single design job. Mark actually gave me my first ever、uh, freelance opportunity when I was still in college.、Um, then we did like three or four different companies together. We've、uh, worked together for nine years, almost ten years now. And one day in San Diego, we were just fed up with our job and.、Um, We're like, let's just start selling some of your art because at this point, I was decorating our apartments with just、mm-hmm. random art I would have made in the、yeah. past. And that one night, we're like, all right, let's think of a name.、Um, let's think of a couple pieces to make、mm-hmm. um, to post on Instagram. So obviously, I was like, okay, what kind of content are people consuming on Instagram?、Yeah. Like he said, it was、uh, you know photography, memes, and motivational quotes. Yeah. So we try to kind of. Make a couple pieces that kind of fit in that realm, and people would resonate on Instagram. I remember we sold ten pieces the first night.、Um, What was we, that ten pieces? Do you remember? Was it,、um, a, was it a quote thing? Was it, was it like the bowl stuff? Rally? No, it was.、Uh, it was a piece we don't have. Okay. I,、um, have up anymore? Yeah. There was no expectations to answer your yeah, question. It was. Just,、uh, we had no idea we were、there. getting into at that point.、Uh, I was in the negative. I don't know. We were both. Yeah, I was, Both fairly broke, living in a 500 square foot apartment in Carlsbad. So really,、uh, any extra money was good money for us at that time. The cool thing was that I like telling is that me and him came from a background where, when we make product, we have to kind of tech pack it, you know, send it to the factories in China, get a sample,、mm-hmm. shoot it, and if something went wrong, we'd have to redo the tech pack, send it back, and keep waiting. So the, you know, the feedback loop in production was, you know, could be two to four months,、mm-hmm. but. On this night, when we made this piece and we posted on Instagram, immediately we immediately yeah, were seeing sales, and I designed it like an hour ago, and now we're getting money directly in our account. So for us, it was a huge deal, and we've never even 
knew this was possible. So it was like hitting the lottery for us selling right. those 10 pieces and fast forward and today and we've sold. So definitely Instagram has been the key to distribution. Yeah. Do you think it's changed sort of the appreciation of art and like um, it sort of exposed more people to appreciating visual? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think with our attention, I think one thing, the cool thing about Iconic and the way I create is I'm highly aware of people's attention spans and behavior on the platforms right. in which they're consuming, you know, the art, which plays a huge part on kind of how, you know, I create our pieces. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things that go into it, but um, I think we've kind of changed the way art is consumed and purchased. Mm -hmm. People didn't even know where to buy art. When you asked them before us, where do you buy art? You know, the answers art. were like, com, like Google it. I don't Z know. Gallery, yeah. Ikea, and it was very, um, Basically, oh, yeah, those IKEA pieces. It, it was dull art. Yeah. It, was, it was a lot of stock images, and obviously Jeff brought a lot more, you know, pizzazz to the space. So that's cool. And you guys have a pretty unique strategy, like working with um, brands, like yeah. known known brands, and and maybe you can tell me some yeah, a little I mean, bit about that. The whole idea was to be the first art brand. You know, we didn't want to be a marketplace hmm. where someone goes and there's a whole bunch of different artists, and mm -hmm. you're just picking. Oh, I kind of like this aesthetic, this aesthetic, and no one knows who the artists are. Um, we wanted to be the first brand. By doing that, we kind of created our own DNA of motivation and inspiration, mm -hmm. and then kind of took different aesthetics and collaborations and people and IP and licenses and mixed them together to almost, you know, be an, almost like a streetwear collab. If you would see got it, yeah, so totally, like yeah. Aesthetics and collaborations and people and IP and licenses and mix them together to almost. From, from a structural standpoint, we always look at deals now where it's one of two different types of people. It's either entrepreneurs that align with their DNA, the motivation, the entrepreneurship, the inspiration. They give us their quotes and their DNA and then Jeff's aesthetic. Yeah. Or artists come to us and then Jeff infuses our motivational and entrepreneurial DNA. So it's either artists or entrepreneurs. And then the third bucket is licenses where we take iconic licenses like Monopoly and then we spin our DNA on it. So. Yeah. That formula, as we've we've grown bigger, we've become very steadfast and, and we only work with these types of people. Yeah. Like yesterday we were at breakfast um, with a guy with very big distribution and he's like, hey, you know, do you want to collab? He's showing us the pieces. And we're like, hey, if we do it, it's gotta be this way. He didn't want to do it and we're not gonna do it. Got it. Yeah. What's been your favorite? Yeah, what's been your favorite collab so far? I'm very, very excited for Monopoly. That's amazing, um, right? This is Ironically enough, uh, when I was home for the holidays, I, uh, I played Monopoly with my family. Uh, just so much nostalgia tied to it. Yeah. Um, and then for me, Muhammad Ali was the first major license we got, and that was just that just opened up everything for us. So I'll forever be indebted to uh, Muhammad Ali and the guys. We actually were just talking about Authentic Brands Group, ABG. They, yeah. they gave us. I was a, a kid that barged into their booth at the licensing expo. They had yeah. no business giving me the license, and uh, they gave me a shot. And the first quarter with them we beat their poster licensee of 20 plus years. Wow. So, I mean, the numbers spoke for themselves. I mean, that's kind of crazy. I mean, negotiating licenses with like Hasbro or, or whoever yeah. who are he's, owning. He's the best to ever do it in, in, terms, nice of, yeah, in yeah. terms of getting licenses. He's, Has it been sort of cachet that you've built out over time that's given you leverage? I mean, or the first the first one, was it just pure hustle and? Yeah, so, yeah. so the first one, I, uh, I went to the licensing expo with no hotel, no tickets, no nothing, show up, get tickets, go in. I spend the first day just watching and listening and looking. Um, and then I identified Authentic Brands Group on the wall. They had Monroe, Elvis, Ali. Ali was someone that we targeted. And I tried to get an appointment. And they're like, no, you, know, you need an appointment. And then I was listening in the background. I heard some names. And then I went on LinkedIn that night. And I came up and found a name, Luke Walsh. And then the next day, I was like, oh, I have an appointment with Luke. And I, was, and I, and I screamed his name. And then he turned around. I saw it was him. And then I basically just hounded him. And I got the last day the last meeting, and I went psycho with him. I was like, if this is not the best meeting you have, I'll pay you money. And he just started laughing. He's like, okay, I'll give you 10 minutes. And I told him about how we were spending um, money to acquire the customer. And their traditional partners were brick and mortar customers that are in the hot topics of the world and the Walmarts of the world. And I was like, hey, you know, we can be your guinea pig to show you that this D to C life is it's a real business. And uh, he basically took a flyer on me, fucking crushed it. And then we went and we got more licenses from them. That's amazing. Yeah. So how old is the company now? It's three years? Uh... So technically we started in 2016 and then in 2017 it really started going in March. We did the first couple million in revenue part-time, mm -hmm. 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. till 
sleep. So you could say 2016, but I would really say. Yeah, 2017. I think right when we got on Facebook and actually yeah. really, okay, this is a company mm -hmm. and not just, you know. So not uh, even three years. Hustle. Not even three years. Time flies. Uh, yeah. That's a long time compared to year route though. Right. I mean, well. Crazy. I mean, it's a whole year. It's, it's a whole entire life of building. But, right. You know, you know, yeah. I think for, for for us as well, like what we what we saw when you bring product to the market that really wants it, it's and and you guys are are seeing a hole in the market as well, and I totally resonate with that. Like even as someone who, I mean, I, I after this, I'm probably going to look at your iconic catalog because I'm decking out my new place. And um, yeah, you're you're right. Most posters are boring. The thing that was interesting about our conversation before off camera is. What, what I like about with you guys is you guys are same as us, disruptors, yeah. but then you have a strategy and there's patience involved and you're mm -hmm. gonna stick to your guns. And that's how you get longevity with the brand. You know, a lesser man would have talked to the guy yesterday that wanted to do a deal with us when I said, yeah. I mean, the guy's got a million followers. The stuff looked cool, right. but we said it doesn't align with our DNA. And, right. and, and us sticking to our guns is why I think this is, you know, iconic is gonna become an iconic you know, Amazing. brand. What's the essence of that DNA? Maybe dig in a bit more. Like, is it based on your, you guys' personal It's me and Jeff. Yeah. yeah. It's just the... You know, we laughed at, you know, before we got on camera, we didn't even know that was our DNA. We, we, we just had like psychotic work, that work ethics and we had a very rough upbringing to get where we were together. Mm -hmm. I mean, me and him have gone through a lot of shit together, a lot of companies telling us we weren't worth no X amount of money that will never, I'll never be better than a, just a graphic, an entry level graphic mm -hmm. designer. So there's a lot of, you know, crap that built up to this. And just that one day um, that we decided to start this, um, it just kind of slowly built into then to get other people coming like, yo, you guys, your story is insane. You guys are actually living the pieces you're creating. And we kind of just double, tripled down on that idea and um, started talking more our story. It's all about consumption though. I mean, he's like a big, you know, he watches all Gary's, Gary Vaynerchuk stuff on YouTube. Gary's a partner of ours. I'm a big reader. And, you know, I remember in the beginning we were watching um, the social network and, you know, Timberlake, Sean Parker makes that line. A million dollars is, you know, it's cool, a billion dollars. Yeah. And then right then and there, Jeff's like, oh, I like that, wrote down his notepad. Next day he made the piece. It's a mixture. Obviously Jeff is the idea guy. He's the execution. I give him some ideas. He laughs and all my ideas suck. But uh, it's really just, he could be walking around, he could see colors, he could see quotes, he could see words. Yeah. And then it just, it goes into his idea bank and then he does what he does, I leave him alone. And, yeah, and, and like, I, I was a terrible student um, mm -hmm. growing up. The only thing I excelled in was art and, you know, Mark, he wasn't a very good student either, but um, it came from that as well. Yeah. And, and almost like, it's almost like I wanted to show that, you know, I am smart. Like I actually do know what I'm talking about. So like there's a lot of, a lot of, things just built up in our past that we want to showcase that just because you're not a good student or just mm -hmm. because traditionally people put you in this box, like you can excel with just hard work and hustle and, and just believing in your vision and dream. And we're most definitely, we most definitely have a chip on our shoulder. I think that that's most founders, I think. Yeah. yeah and I, I, the, the, the crazy thing with me and him is just, we're always going to embrace the underdog mentality and we're yeah. never going to get, I mean, I'm a very uh, confident guy, borderline arrogant, people could say, but I mean, I'm, I am literally, you know, have a lot of humility. I think that I suck. Uh, I think anybody on the street can teach me anything. Everybody can teach me something and I'm always gonna stay down in the trenches and stay grinding. I'll mm -hmm. never get too big for anything because that's when you fail. Yeah. So we have a chip on our shoulders, but at the same time, we're humble and we work hard. That's so cool. How do you guys bump up against the, the, the fine art world, like the existing art? We're here at Art Basel, yeah. right? I mean, have you kind of interfaced with them? Do you, have you learned? It's, and, and it's kind of a crazy space on its own. I love, you're I don't the first know. person that's answered that. Yeah. And uh, I want to hear, you, uh, so, yeah. you go first. Yeah, you know, I, I grew up actually not liking art and art galleries and art history and almost like uh, the art kind of sewers. Right. It just... That whole entire snobbiness yeah. of art. You like, like the work, you like the design, you like the, yeah, the visuals. You know what? I just, I always liked other people liking my stuff. Yeah. And I think a lot, what a lot of artists don't do is design for the people. They kind of design for themselves. Um, and I want to be in every single home. That's so interesting, yeah. You know, so this is my way to kind of inspire everyone, as, or as many people as I can, yeah. to kind of do what I did and to achieve my dreams and doing having art to be my career, which has almost been since I was six years old, I was told that's what I was gonna do. Yeah. And I love it, don't get me wrong, but I wanna help people, other people in the world inspire them. That's super profound actually. You know, most artists are, are, are trying to portray themselves yeah. and what, what they that's want. 
Yeah. He used to be emotional in the beginning, and now <laughs> yeah. what he does is he's taking a system, systematic business mm -hmm. approach to everything. So if he sees an overlay doing well, he'll mimic that overlay in another piece. Yeah. So it's all about split testing, and, and it's basically almost like, it's like ads. Yeah. It's all about totally. optimization. And I mean, to think that an artist, an art company is, is, is data focused, is I think is, is pretty rare in this world. It makes so much sense. Like yeah, it, it just makes sense from a business yeah. perspective. Yeah, You're a businessman, yeah. but when you deal with artists, they um I I think it's safe to say that a lot of fine artists do not like us. A lot of them don't like us because they think obviously we're taking market share from them. And you know if you're in the three thousand dollar price range and we come in for a thirty by forty that costs two hundred fourteen dollars yeah. landed, we're taking market share. Yeah. But um, I had a profound conversation with this guy named the most famous artist yesterday. He's actually a couple doors down, mm -hmm. and he's uh, he's a Stanford major. Um, he's talking optimization and split testing with us. It was, it was and he respects what we're doing, just like I respect what he's doing. Yeah. This is not a zero sum game. You know what I'm saying? Like you can go get yours and we can go get ours. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, for me, you know, I wear some nice stuff, but then all I can wear a Zara t-shirt. It's, it's a mix and match game. Yeah. So um, I think that, you know, in the, in the office, in the gym, even in the home, you can have our pieces. And if they want one signature peach that, that costs $10,000, you can go and do that. So the fine art world, most definitely some of us, some of them don't like what we're yeah. doing. Do you, do you imagine going to that universe, like selling higher end? Pieces? I used to do that. And, oh, okay. I, and I left oh, that interesting. Yeah. because um, it's not as scalable. And although I love selling, um, I'd like to be making money while I'm sleeping. That's, mm. That sounds like a better life to me. Yeah. And um, we've become, you know, me and Jeff are obsessive over, over business and learning. Yeah. And this whole entire D to C digital landscape is just so intriguing to us. And I think that what's unique about us compared to a lot of these other companies is I always look at business as the front end and the back end. The front end is brand, the back end is the data, the analytics, the mm -hmm. optimization. And I think that we're deeply passionate about both. So I'm deeply excited about optimizing our existing business, especially the back end and they can go sell their $10,000 pieces. I'm not interested. And it also goes back to like, I'm just deeply passionate about giving the market what they actually want. Right. Um, it's like business one Yeah. And yeah. some people overlook that. <laughs> yeah, and a, and a lot of artists um, growing up, and because I've been a lot of, around a lot of artists growing up since I was very little, is a lot of them just make what they, they want to make for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no, you know, objection to that, but I'm deeply passionate about having people like, you know, what they put on their walls. And mm -hmm. I, I have a good pulse on what I think people like, and that's always been one of my strengths. Yeah. So it's just me catering to um, what I truly believe in and what I think, you know, people want. Like, I want to know what you like so you can put on your wall and mm -hmm. you and you and you. Yeah. So um, I think it's just having a different um, mission. It's just our mission's different than maybe theirs. Right. Do you think like, what you're doing would have been possible without Instagram? No, it's, it's really changed the sort of the becoming. Well, yeah, it was actually, it's almost like Instagram helped in the formula, the formula for the company. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. it's, it's more of a behavior trait and, and studying, you know, um, psych, psychological behaviors on different platforms. Yeah. So. I mean, I think that anybody that's doing paid attribution for the most, most part, over 50% of their ad spend is on Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. I think that's a safe assumption to make. Yeah. From a scale perspective, I think Instagram is paramount to the growth of our business. And obviously we're aesthetic based yep. and Instagram is the aesthetic platform. Um, so yeah, Instagram is where just the whole genesis of the concept came. We didn't even, in the beginning, we were building an email list. Mm -hmm. We, had, I mean, we had never come from a world where you optimize an email list. So we had all these emails and we never sent an email. When we started doing ads, we did just Instagram ads. Yeah. We didn't even know that anything else. So yeah, Instagram forever indebted to you. I love you, Instagram. It's so interesting because I'm thinking about the analogy to like the music space. So you have you, you used to have radio, and that was what surfaced like the top hits. And you were talking about commercial artists, so that was what made pop music happen. You had the distribution channel, you had curators, and now I guess before Instagram, we didn't have anything for for visuals. There's Nothing. No entry to there's no any yeah. Industry. There's TV, but you don't put art on on TV as yeah. as a visual means. And so Instagram came along. And um, and made this this will happen. Just kind of interesting, clicking in my my head to see how this whole thing happens. Um, do you guys go? Do you guys see yourself doing stuff beyond you know canvases and, and art as yeah. well? Have you been, been doing dabbling products or, or yeah, anything so else? Yeah, uh, twenty twenty is going to be a really interesting year for us. I think we've built a great brand, uh, a great customer base, and unfortunately, there's only so much room on the walls. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we have people teetering for more stuff. Yeah. So we've signed um, some pretty big uh, master licensing deals. 
And uh, for the most part, we're going to be selling stuff, um, you know, through us where we own the customer. But we're also going to start um, licensing out some IP into other product mediums. Merch is one of them. Very so cool. uh, we're really excited because I just think that it's just one more touch point where our, yeah. our, our, our family, our, our customers can support us. Yeah. Do you think we're getting into a physical collectible culture? Like, I, I mean, we, there's, there's like, um, I, we we're so used to digital collectibles. There, there was a period of time in the last few years where digital collectibles were the fad and in-game stuff. But now, I guess we're, we're kind of also wanting some of the stuff we see online in our homes, on our desks, and and on our walls. Breaking news: We signed a, a master collectible deal with Sideshow Collectibles, the biggest awesome. collectible company in the world. Very cool. So we're gonna bring his uh, his two D. Uh, concepts into 3D, mm. which we've been working on that for a while. That'll probably release Q2 2020. But um, to answer your question too, uh, a lot of now our pieces we're kind of building around as collections for that sole purpose. Because mm-hmm. um, now we're noticing a lot of people are buying bundles and it's e- it's easier to tell people what they should buy yeah. um, instead of just one single singular piece. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's been definitely a strategy uh, we've been using. Yeah. What's the, what, are the, what are the profiles of your, your customers actually? Are they you know folks like you and me? Do we yeah, so urban the, consumers? The, the, the genesis of the company. Keep in mind when the company started, we weren't online marketers. I mm-hmm. mean, in February of 2017, I didn't even know what ROAS was, return on ad spend, mm-hmm. and now we're like so deep in this. Yeah. In this, so <clears throat> all it is is our customers, me and Jeff. 18 to 35 year old males that are into motivation and, and inspiration, and then it's extended into different subsets of those. So imagine that, but it's extended into maybe a little bit older and a little bit younger. Imagine that, and it's extended into a female version of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So for the time being, it's really just been me and Jeff in a, in a male and female version. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of going back to the front end and the back end. As we optimize the back end and really understand the analytics, we're going to get way deeper into that, yeah. which is something that me and him are so excited about, which, you know, that's happening right now. We're really starting to understand our customer. But for us, I think that there's always, for, for D2C companies out there, for owners that are listening, I think that uh, you know, the best strategic move um, is you want the founders to be uh, passionate customers of their own right, the prime, Yeah, Like this is something that you want. I want. As we understand the data more, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll understand the substance. Do you imagine more. like creating new brands, like sort of a, maybe a female-focused brand or like, a, a different or children's I don't know like the the Jeff me and Jeff all, all the time I mean people watching you could probably tell that I have attention deficit disorder um my big thing is focus that's been the reason why it's taken me this long to be successful so uh I think Jeff is the more conservative guy that keeps us focused yeah. so for the time being we're just going to stick with iconic and we're going to build that's that into so a cool. monster yeah um maybe there'll be subsets under the iconic umbrella but it's been really tough as you, I mean, I'm sure you know, as you gain success, you yeah. start getting people like, hey, you want to do this project? I'll give you this percent equity. We're yeah. back by this money. So we are staying focused on the mission. To answer your question, yes, we we are going into some of those things. And it, it's it's bringing new life. Within Iconic. Yeah, 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 within Iconic. Yeah. Cool. And it's, yeah, it's bringing new life to us. And it's also going to extend our customer base uh, and our demographic. That's nice, man. And you've pulled in some interesting people to work with, um, work alongside with with iconic advisors and investors like Gary. How how did that happen? Gary V story is pretty simple. He, uh, Vayner Sports, um, wanted Jeff to do the style guide and the logos for them. Uh, He did it. They asked asked how much. We said nothing. And then uh, a couple months later, we just sent a super savage email, simple email. Here's our revenue, the last X amount of months. We're Gary Uh Disciples. We'd love to get 15 minutes with Gary. Uh, I get a, a screenshot from uh, Justin Giagrande, one of, one of our guys over there, um, with Gary. Um, said set up a 15-minute meeting at the Beverly Hills Hotel. It's at 5.30 the next week, 5.30 to 5.45. Uh, turned into an hour meeting, and he's like, I like everything I'm hearing. Uh, yeah. You guys should come to New York next week. We went to New York the following week and uh, spent the day at his office, and we actually were in a, a music studio um, until probably 2 o'clock in the morning with Gary. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what are we going to do? And while we were doing that, we were also in talks with Scooter Braun. Mm-hmm. And then they had never done a deal together. And they were both big Jets fans. They were friends. <laughs> so then we kind of just merged them both together and then just came with a colossal press release. And it's been amazing. Very cool. Yeah. Well, awesome, guys. Thanks so much for, for sharing your story. And, Circle, uh, life, yeah. Circle, Circle life. Circle life. Yeah. We, we also have the same birthday. birthday so and we also have the same birthday. Celebrating. <laughs> so, yeah, we keep that off camera. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>